My name is Paddy Hirsch, I'm a senior editor at Marketplace, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about credit default swaps. Now, a lot of people have been talking about credit default swaps or CDS recently, and um, talking about them being part of the cause for the whole financial meltdown that we're seeing right now. And they are indeed part of the cause, but they're not the main cause, although some people would, some people are beginning to point the finger at them. The, essentially what a credit default swap is, it's a contract that uh, a bank has signed with another bank or another financial institution. And these contracts have spread all the way throughout the system. They account for trillions of dollars of, um, of, of contracts throughout the financial system. They've glued all the banks together. So when a bank starts to collapse uh, because of its exposure, say, to um, CDOs or bad mortgages or whatever it may be, the credit default swaps is, begin is because it's glued that bank to a number of other banks, it's beginning to drag all the banks down with it. It's obviously very complex, but at its heart, a credit default swap, it's not, it's not alchemy, it's nothing secret. Essentially what it is, it's, it's an insurance contract. And when you've, if you've been reading the papers recently, you've probably realized that people are not calling them credit default swaps anywhere, anymore, they're calling them insurance. So let's just call it insurance, rather than using the CDS or credit default swap. All right, so here we have our insurance. And we've got two characters. All right, we've got Sam, who's a banker. We've got Jim, who is his old frat fraternity brother, who works for an insurance company. Say, just for argument's sake, AIG. Now, Sam, when he becomes a banker, first thing he does is he goes out and he buys a Ferrari because he is a banker. Bankers love fast cars. Now, what he has to do when he gets the Ferrari, of course, he has to insure it. So he calls his old friend, friend Jim and he says, hey mate, I've got this new Ferrari, I need to insure it, can you do me a deal? Jim says, absolutely, the usual terms apply, you know, I will make you whole if, this, if your Ferrari is, isn't in an accident in some way, I'll pay you some money, a big bag of money, and in return you pay me a premium. Now at about the same time, Sam did his first deal at the bank, and his first deal was he bought five million dollars in General Motors bonds. Okay, so that's what he bought, five million dollars. Now he's a little nervous. You know, General Motors is a good company by the time that he bought it, but he's a little nervous. You know, he's got this shiny deal and he wants to insure that too. So he brings up Jim and he says, Jim, I bought five million dollars in GM bonds. Can you insure them for me? And Jim says, well, how can I do that? He says, well, it's the same way. It's the same way that you insured my Ferrari. You know, if the bonds default and they trade down in the market, then you make up the difference so that I'm still worth five million on my deal, and in return I'll pay you a premium every month. So instead of an insurance company on a car, what we've got is an insurance company on five million dollars of General Motors bonds. It lasts for five years, say, on five million dollars, and that is essentially the credit default swap. What's happened, it's an insurance contract, Sam has swapped the risk. Now Jim holds the risk, and in return, Jim is getting a premium, say $100,000 a year. It's paid every year for five years until the contract expires, just like an insurance contract on his Ferrari. So that's the basic concept of a credit default swap, but there is a slight wrinkle. And the wrinkle is that in order to make sure that Jim will actually pay up that money if there is a default on the General Motors bonds, he wants Jim to put up some collateral. Okay, so he goes to Jim and he says, look, AIG is a big company, you guys have got loads of money, so I'm not going to need too much collateral. Let's just say 500,000. So there's the collateral on that deal. Now obviously, if General Motors bonds go south and Jim has to pay the bag of money to make Sam good, then he can take that money from the collateral and pay up, or the collateral just goes away, whatever. At the end of the five years, if the contract expires, just like an insurance contract, if the contract expires, then the $500,000 in collateral goes away, Jim takes that back. Meanwhile, he's had the $100,000 every year, which is keeping him in the deal. So, and that's the, uh, the little wrinkle that makes a, a credit default swap different to an insurance contract like a regular insurance company. But this collateral package is a bit of a problem for AIG, and we saw how it was a problem recently. Because Sam may not be the only person that Jim is doing an insurance deal with on, say, General Motors bonds, or anything else for that matter. He may have done a deal with bankers 
all over the world, all over the country, wherever. In each one of these situations, he will have to, he will have, to have surrendered a collateral package of $500,000. Now, what happens if General Motors starts to look a little risky? Right now, AIG is rated AAA by Standard & Poor's. But Standard & Poor's realizes that Jim has all of these other contracts, and in each case, he's got $500,000 $500, in collateral. And in each case, he's going to be having to pay out money to all of these counterparties in the deal, because General Motors is getting a little risky. So Standard & Poor's says, well, maybe AIG is not worth AAA anymore. Maybe we're going to knock them down to Triple B, for example. Now, Sam is a smart guy. And in his contract, he has said, if you get downgraded, you've got to pay me more collateral because I'm, you're more of a risk to me. The risk is now, not only is there a risk that General Motors is going to default, there's also a risk that Jim might not be good for the money. So in order to insure against that risk, a secondary insurance, if you like, Sam is asking for more collateral. So he asks for $1.5 million in collateral. But it also means that every single one of these other counterparties also wants an extra million dollars. And suddenly, Jim is finding himself being dragged down by all of the demands, all these what are called collateral calls. And of course, then Standard & Poor's watches this and thinks, well, maybe we'll knock him down even further. Knock him, knock him down into junk range. And again, the collateral call goes up. And that's what happened to AIG. It was dragged down by all of these collateral calls, which nearly put it in the hole. Now, people have asked me, how, does the, uh, how do you determine what the bag of money is that these guys are going to pay across? Well, just the same way that if, you're, if, if Sam's Ferrari uh, is damaged in some way, the insurance company makes an assessment and pays out what it thinks what it needs to make uh, Sam's, Ferrari, Sam's Ferrari whole and, and brand spanking new again. In the case of the General Motors bonds, the, the, the arbiter is not uh, the, the insurance company. The arbiter is the market is Sam, now that General Motors has defaulted, will try and sell those bonds in the market. And say, for example, they trade at, I don't know, 60 cents on the dollar. Jim has agreed to make Sam whole, he's agreed to make sure that he has $5 million uh, complete. So because of that secondary market trade, Jim now knows he is going to have to pay Sam uh, $2 million. And that is, the make, that, that is the make whole that he pays to, to Sam in order to, to keep him complete. Now the tricky bit about this is that obviously it's an insurance contract and there are many of these insurance contracts out there. The tricky bit of, of it is that companies like AIG have done credit default swap deals with hundreds if not thousands, perhaps even millions of, of other counterparties. Likewise, Sam might have done these other deals as well. And not only is Sam or not only is Jim insuring Sam, Sam might be insuring other people. So Sam doesn't necessarily have to be the person being protected. He can also be the, the person selling the insurance. And so what you have is an enormous web. So Sam is insuring other people or being insured by other people, and they may in turn be insuring each other. And that's where the web comes in. So when you look at a company like Lehman Brothers or AIG uh, failing for whatever reason, the failure starts to drag down the rest of the system because Lehman Brothers has been tied in through all of these contracts with a number of other financial institutions. So as Lehman Brothers starts to teeter, or AIG starts to teeter, it can't unravel these deals and it starts to drag other banks down with it. And Lehman Brothers, even now in this situation where Lehman Brothers is being broken up and sold, people aren't, still aren't sure what happens to those contracts. You know, Lehman Brothers was supposed to pay certain amounts in collateral. It was. It was, um, you know, it had agreements to pay out in, event, in events of default, and people indeed have been betting on Lehman Brothers. So what you what you have is this this web that is that is starting to suck people down. But in the end, the thing that irritates people more than anything else about the credit default swap market is that, as you can see, it is an insurance contract. The credit default swaps are insurance contracts, but they're also bets, because Sam, in this case, owns five million dollars of GM bonds. He doesn't necessarily have to have any exposure to GM at all. He may just decide that he wants to bet that GM is going to fail. And it's quite legal for him to do that, unlike if you bet on the Red Sox, which you know would be illegal. But he's quite able to make that bet with Jim. Jim's able to take the bet, 
And you can do that with any company that you like. And these, these uh, credit default swaps are traded over the counter, which means that nobody knows how many there are, or, who's, or who, what, what deals have been done and who's, who's, who's done them with whom. The, uh, nobody's obliged to tell any regulatory agency, like the SEC. So consequently, not only do we have an enormous web that's binding all these banks together, but that web is of an unknown quantity. Nobody knows how big it is or how far it extends or who's involved. And we only find out whenever a company begins to collapse and suddenly it finds itself, you know, a second bank finds itself being dragged along with it and a third and a fourth and so on and on ad infinitum. And that's the situation that we find ourselves in today.